you didn't see those details there, two weeks from today, February 27th, our youth will have their annual fundraiser dinner, 5.30 in the fellowship hall. It's just by donation, so you just come. I just got word that food's going to be Italian, and there might be some bingo being played, so there's no money exchanged, so it's okay. We can do that in the Baptist church, all right? So um, two weeks from now, make your plans, and just a reminder, again, the wall of love that we normally do, we're not doing on the walls, so just be prayerful and be mindful about what God may be leading you to give to help our youth um, go into camp and other activities this year. Two more announcements real quick. We'll pray and we'll prepare our hearts for worship. This afternoon when we get through, we've got a special luncheon for our widows, widowers, our singer, senior, uh, single adults. Um, if you didn't sign up and you're here and you can come, come on, we got food for you, all right? I'll, I'll for go eating for you, all right? So uh, it's at 1130. I'm going to say a prayer for the food so that when you finish, you all can just go on over there and start eating. But that's for all of our, our we want to honor you this morning in that special way. Third and finally, Sunday, March 6th, it's going to be kind of a mini kickoff Sunday. We're going to have Lord's Supper that morning. We'll, um, my prayer team's going to get started again praying during the service. We're going to start our Sunday night studies as well. Um, Impact Youth happening, our children's zip and children's choir. And there'll be two studies offered. One of them is a, a lady study, Jude, by um, Jackie Hill Perry. There's a, a sign-up table in the, the back uh, by the office back there. Any ladies interested in that? The other class I'm going to offer at the same time is an evangelism training class on free circles. And let me give two um, announcements about it. Number one, it's not a Bible study. So if you want to study the Bible, if you're not going to Jude, you can, that's why we have Sunday school. But number two, it's also going to be a very participating class. We're going to be practicing sharing your faith. So I, I encourage, I want everybody there that can be there, but if you're not comfortable with that, just know that ahead of time. This is going to be something, I've got booklets for anybody that comes. You come, no charge. You come, but again, we're going to start that off in evangelism class for us just to practice and get mindful of the importance of sharing and knowing how to share Christ with those around us. Gather your hearts with me. Let's open up with a word of prayer as we enter his presence this morning. Father, too often I enter your presence too hastily, too hurriedly, with my own agenda. And I confess that and ask your forgiveness. As I gather with my brothers and sisters this morning, as we enter your presence, we want to just follow your agenda. What's on your heart? What you want us to know? All that we know this morning is that we just want to worship Jesus exalt him, praise him, give him the glory, prepare our hearts, prepare our time this morning as we worship the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And good morning to you. Welcome. Let's stand together and let's sing. Glorious is thy name, O Lord. Blessed Savior, we adore Thee, we Thy love and grace proclaim. Thou art mighty, Thou art holy, glorious is Thy matchless name. Yes. 
saints of every nation sing thy just and endless praise glorious 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 is thy name O Lord glorious 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 is thy name O Lord we're going to stop and do something a little different this morning the screen in the balcony will not come on as of right now and if you'll notice the choir is just kind of they deer in headlights so choir here's what we're going to do you're going to get your exercise this morning you're going to come down and sit until it's time to sing, and then you're going to come back up here and sing. Okay, so y'all go down, stay in line. All right. They know a few of those words, but they don't know many. So, all righty. <laughs> I could have just done this number, but I don't believe they could have read that. And if I did that number, then I wouldn't read it. And then we would really be in trouble because when I, I just make them up as I go. All righty. Okay. Let's see. So we have finished Glorious is Thy Name, so now we're going to go into Wonderful, Merciful Savior. So, Carolyn, just give us some kind of introduction on that. Wonderful. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger. always hunger for you are the one that we praise you are the one we adore you give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger And I keep from singing your praise. How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your praise? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, 
his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Amen. Y'all be seated for a moment. Y'all been standing for a little bit. We read from God's Word, and we have a special prayer this morning. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7, beginning verse 32. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to, dis- to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. You know, marriage is to be valued, and children are a gift from God, but too often we fail to honor and recognize those that God has in their single their season of singleness. And the church fails too often to celebrate celibacy. And so this morning, as we have a special luncheon for our widows, widowers, our single adults, I want to say a special prayer and thank the Lord for every one of you. Would you gather your hearts with me this morning? Father, I thank you so much for our precious brothers and sisters, your saints, those who are unmarried, their devotion to you, their love for you, the courage that they have to come on a Sunday morning. I know a lot of married couples, if the other one's not there, they're not going to show up on a Sunday morning because they're too insecure. I thank you so much, Lord, for those that you have here. Bless them, strengthen them, anoint them. May we, as this church body, honor them. And I pray that the special lunch today will be a special time that we can just honor them and just thank you and praise you, Lord, for them. Bless them and keep them. Make your face shine upon them. Be gracious to them. Lift up your countenance, your favor upon them, and give them your peace. In Jesus Christ's name, and all of God's people said, amen. sitting right down here better. Uh, I can hear them better down here than I can up there. Uh, Might just let y'all start singing down here. You know, all you have to do is just turn around and sing. (laughs) Um, I would let y'all start coming back up here now because but you won't know this first hymn that well, so just stay down there. And when we get to give thanks, I've changed the words some on it, so you won't know what I've changed them to either. So the minute we finish singing, the ushers will be down here. Okay? Somebody's going to pray, and the ushers are going to stay right there. Don't move, ushers, after the prayer. Choir's going to come up. And let them get out of the way, and then y'all can depart into pieces, and you can go take up the offering, okay? That clear as mud? Good. All right, I've done my job then. I have confused everybody. All right, let's stand together and rejoice, ye pure in heart. Rejoice, ye pure in heart. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, 
beneath the standard of your God, the cross of Christ your King. Rejoice, 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 give thanks and sing. Yes, on through life's long path, still singing as you youth to age by night and day in gladness and in woe rejoice 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 give thanks and sing and give thanks with a grateful heart give thanks with a grateful heart give thanks to the Holy One give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son give thanks with a grateful heart give thanks to the Holy One give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. And now strong. Let the poor say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. And now of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the sick say, I am whole. Let the bound say, I am free because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks give thanks let us pray <clears throat> my heavenly father thank you for the privilege to be able to come to you in prayer and thank you for loving us thank you for your mercy and your grace and and, Father, as a song earlier, rejoice. And I pray, Father, that we can rejoice in all things, even through our suffering. There are so many biblical characters who found that rejoice while they were still suffering for the glorif glorifying you. And I thank you, Father, for this time and this service. And I pray that we allow that Holy Spirit to work in our lives and allow what the preacher had to say to go with us, carry it out. And I pray for this country, our nation, and we bless these tithes and offerings. We take it in your name. Amen.
we help raise him up. That's what the Lord does for us too. So we sing, you raise me up.
Amen. We have such an awesome, talented choir. We really, really do. Praise the Lord for you all. If you've got your Bibles this morning, I'm going to be in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, if you're turning and finding Luke chapter 7. Now, the, the choir are disappearing, so they can't answer my question, but I want to open up with a question this morning. How many of you all have ever broken a bone in your body? Raise your hands. All right, I see some hands. Okay. All right, you can put your hands down. I've told the story when I was about 11, I jumped off a 10 foot slide and broke a couple of toes in my foot. My brother fell out of a tree and broke his arm. My youngest sister tumbled down some stairs and broke her arm. You know, breaking a bone is kind of a rite of passage in life. You know, it hurts and we suffer, but we survive and we get stronger, stronger physically and stronger mentally and emotionally. In the same way, to be broken spiritually is also a rite of passage. In that when we're broken spiritually, we see the strength of the Lord in a mighty way in our lives, in, around, and through us. That's why we need to say yes to brokenness. We continue our series, those of you who are joining us this morning, We've been in a series we started a few weeks ago called Say Yes to Jesus. And the premise of this series is about our, deci- our walk with Jesus, being disciples of Jesus. You know, to live the Christian life, it's not about, okay, I'm going to try hard to be a better Christian. Lord, help me. I hear so many Christians say, I wanna, I'm going to try to be a better Christian. That's not how it works. Jesus consistently gives you and I the option every moment by moment to say yes to him. We either say yes, Jesus, or we say no. And this morning, we're going to talk about saying yes in brokenness. Now, what does it mean to be broken? Brokenness means yielding my self-will to God. Brokenness means yielding my self-will to God, just as a horse that's broken is finally obedient to its master, to its trainer, Brokenness involves my humility and my obedience to the prompting of God's Spirit or the revelation of His Word. Brokenness involves the response of my, hum- uh, my humility and my obedience to the prompting of either God's Spirit or the revelation of His Word. Brokenness allows the fragrance of Christ to be lived out through me, to be lived out through you, to be released in your life, in my life. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus is invited for a meal by a Pharisee, a religious leader. And while he's eating this meal, a woman shows up. And this woman displays brokenness. This woman shows us what it means to say yes in brokenness. We're going to be in Luke 7, verses 36 to 50. I'm in the New American Standard, so you can Look on with me and listen or look in your own translation. Luke 7, beginning verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him, Jesus, to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. When she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what, who and what sort of woman, person this woman is who is touching him and that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He replied, say it, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will he love more? Simon answered, which of them will love him more? Excuse me. Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who he forgave more. He said to him, you have judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, 
You see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Would you pray with me? Father, this is your word, and I just pray for your anointing, your favor, your hand to just be upon me, upon us this morning. Open our eyes, open our hearts, and may your word have its perfect work and will in our lives that we apply and do your word and be transformed by your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, don't confuse this event with an event in John chapter 12, Mary of Bethany. Also, don't say that this woman is Mary Magdalene, because she's not. This is a, a different woman. This woman's unidentified. We don't know who she is. But all we know that everybody in the area knew that she was a sinner. And so Jesus is having this meal, and while well, he's having this meal, and of course the, the houses at that time were, were open. They were not like our houses that we have doors and windows. It was pretty much like an open portico everywhere you went. And this woman shows up. But what she does and what she expresses is so different. She's not loud. She's not boisterous. She's not even speaking words. She's weeping. She's broken. This morning as we talk about saying yes and brokenness, I want to share with you four observations from God's word about brokenness. And my prayer is that we'll have more people broken in this world, this country, more than ever. We've got problems in our country, but unfortunately trying to solve them with might, we just might need to be, just be broken about it. Four observations about brokenness I want to show you from God's Word this morning. Number one, I want you to notice that brokenness opposes pride. Brokenness opposes pride. Brokenness opposes pride. Now, you see two pictures being painted by Luke here. Verse 36. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Verse 37. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. On one hand, you have this Pharisee, a very religious man. He's serious about sin. He's serious about morality. He's serious about immorality. He's serious about holiness. That's commendable. You don't hear many people talking about holiness these days, and in a few weeks, we're going to talk about holiness in this series. On the other hand, you had this woman who's a sinner. And you see a contrasting picture. This Pharisee who meant well, and Pharisees, Sadducees, Judaizers, Zealots, think of them kind of in, as denominations, if you will. It's probably a good way of thinking about them. And I kind of like to kind of joke that the Pharisees were kind of the Southern Baptists. I mean, they believed God's word. They were serious about God's word. And that's great. We need to be. The danger is start, starting to bleed into the legalism. And what you find here is two pictures here. Brokenness of this woman and pride of this religious Pharisee. Jesus even goes on in verses 39 to 43. And he begins to share this, this parable about a, a money lender, or like a, a, a loaner of money, a, a banker. And, and he says that there are the, this lender loans two, two individuals, denarii, denarii. 
Now, a denarius was about a day's wage. So one person who owed 500 denarii, that was about a year and a half's wages. The other person who owed 50, that's about a month and a half. And his point being is that, you know, Simon, who do you think is going to be more gracious, going to be love, show love better and more? He knows. He knows. You can't be prideful and broken at the same time. Pride and brokenness can't exist together. For those of you who have used magnets before, you know a, a magnet will, will instantly cling to something that's magnetic or will draw something to it. If you ever take a two magnets and try to bring them together, there's like this polarizing force. Brokenness and pride is like that polarizing force. They're not going to come together. And the Bible teaches us again and again that God, when it comes to pride, he's polarized by it, but he's drawn to brokenness. Here are the words of James, James 4, verse 6. James says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Pride and brokenness can't exist together. I came across, somebody put a list, the difference between pride versus brokenness. Humble me for a moment. There was a few of these I had to cut out because there was a big list, but this is a great list to contrast pride and brokenness. Pride grieves God. Brokenness secures grace. Pride keeps you from praying. Brokenness causes you to pray. Pride blinds you to your wicked ways. Brokenness opens your eyes to your wicked ways. Pride keeps you from seeing God's face. Brokenness encourages you to seek God's face. Brokenness is, pride is characterized by a stiff neck. Brokenness is exemplified by a bowed head. Pride compares self against others. Man, I'm more faithful to the Lord, man. I'm doing better church-wise, showing up, giving my tithe. Brokenness compares self with Christ and says, I'm the chief of sinners. Pride is quick to detect pride in others. Brokenness is quick to identify pride in oneself. Pride makes you critical. Brokenness makes you compassionate. Pride hastily applies preaching to others. Amen, preacher. Amen, you tell him. Brokenness is quick to internalize preaching. Pride easily detects the speck in your brother's eye. Brokenness readily detects the beam in your own eye. Pride is consumed with I. Brokenness is concerned with not I, but Christ. Pride makes the faults of others look big and my faults look small. Brokenness makes my sins look big and the faults of others seem small. Pride breeds complacency. Brokenness births hunger and thirst for new spiritual horizons. Pride covers sins. Brokenness discovers sin. Last one. Pride disregards the chief cornerstone. Brokenness falls upon the chief cornerstone. Brokenness opposes pride. Number two, brokenness costs us something. Brokenness costs us something. Brokenness is costly. Now, verse 37 says this woman, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. Now, some of your translations may say ointment, but it's really a, a perfumed oil. You know, ointment is kind of more, we think of like a cream. This was a, a liquid. And it was usually, a, an alabaster vial was usually kind of a clay jar, had a long neck. It was kind of a one and done use. You used it once. And you, when you're ready to use it, you break the neck off the, 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 the clay bottle. And you pour the perfume. And it goes on to say that she was kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Perfume was expensive. It was not cheap. And so this cost this woman a lot of money to buy this perfume, but there was something else that cost her. It cost her tears. Because it says there that she began to wet his feet with her tears. Brokenness is costly. It might cost us a reputation. It might cost us our job. It might cost us a relationship. But whatever the cost, brokenness is worth it. 
Whatever the cost, brokenness is worth it. Why? Because brokenness ushers us into the presence of the Lord. Listen to Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. David prays in Psalm 51, verse 17, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Matthew 21, verse 44, Jesus is speaking of himself as the chief cornerstone. And he says, he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Psalm 147, verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And finally, Isaiah 61, verse 1, Jesus preaches this passage in the temple about himself. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. You know how you and I know that brokenness is costly? Because it cost God his son. Because brokenness cost God his son to send his cross, his son on that cross to be broken for your sins and my sins, to have his flesh torn and broken for the forgiveness of our sins. That's costly. You know, we live in, in a society where something's broken, it's useless. It, it, it's useless. You and I break a appliance, we've got a broken appliance. Oh, well, can't use this anymore, we throw it out. A broken picture, oh, well, this is useless, can't use it anymore. A broken toy a broken tool, in our eyes it's useless. But when it comes to people in God's eyes, when someone's broken, they're useful. Brokenness in a person to God is not useless, it's useful. Brokenness costs us something. But third, brokenness sees the Savior's feet. Brokenness sees the Savior's feet. Now verse 38, notice this. And standing behind him at his feet, the woman weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. And you'll notice in verses 44 to 46, Jesus keeps talking about what the woman's done to his feet. He tells Simon, you know, Simon, you, you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. Verse 45, since I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. Verse 46, she's anointed my feet with perfume. Washing a guest's feet was common courtesy when you entered someone's home. They would make sure that you have their feet washed. And I shared before a couple weeks ago, we forget just people wore open, open toe sandals and their feet were disgusting. But here's the application here. Brokenness gets us so low that we're able to see the, the Savior's feet. You say, why is that important? Because when we get that low and we see the Savior's feet, we're able to watch and see what direction he's heading. We begin to see exactly where he's going for us to follow. Listen to James 4, verses 9 to 10. James writes, Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Verse 10, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. James is talking about brokenness. He's not talking, okay, just start weeping and mourning over something you've lost or something that's happened. You know, he's talking about brokenness. Mourn, weep. And notice what he says in verse 10. And then what happens? Humble yourselves. Get low. Get low enough to see the, the Savior's feet. Tony Evans said it best. He said, sometimes God lets you hit rock bottom so that you will discover that he is the rock at the bottom. Let me say that again. 
Sometimes God lets you hit rock bottom so that you will discover that he is the rock at the bottom. Brokenness sees the Savior's feet. All right, fourth and finally, though, we're talking about saying yes to brokenness. Fourth and finally, brokenness is the gateway to salvation. Brokenness is the gateway to salvation. The gateway to salvation. Now, verse 47, Jesus says to Simon, he says, for this reason, I say to you. Now, remember, he just got through saying, you know, Simon, I, I answered your house. You didn't wash my feet, but she washed them. You didn't give me a kiss. She's been kissing my feet. He says, for this reason, Simon, I say to you, her sins, which are many. He doesn't downplay her sins, all right? He doesn't try to tiptoe around them. Well, you know, it's okay. He doesn't try to make excuses. He doesn't even, he acknowledges them. Her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. And then he says something shocking. Your sins have been forgiven. Now we know this was shocking because verse 49 tells us there that, that those who were reclining at the table with him, they're saying to themselves, Who's this man who even forgives sins? Who does he think he is to forgive sins? I'll tell you who he thinks he is, and he knows he is. The Son of God, the Lamb of God. The woman was not saved because of her love. She was not saved because of her brokenness. She was not saved because of her tears. She was saved because she repented of her sins and put her faith in Jesus Christ as her Savior. That's why she was saved. Somebody said that to be a, a, a sinner is not the worst thing, but to not ask forgiveness through Jesus is. And we're reminded that you can't out -sin yourself the possibility of forgiveness. I just read somewhere, somebody commented on this, and they said, there's more grace and forgiveness than the little toe of Jesus that that woman was washing and kissing than the vilest sinner that's ever lived. And the gateway, the beginning, is salvation, is brokenness. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus preaches a sermon on the mount, probably the greatest sermon ever preached. I haven't preached the Sermon on the Mount here. I probably need to do that here. I preached it in my previous church through it. There's a, a section at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount called the, it starts with a B. What, is it, what are they called? The Beatitudes. There you go. Very good. And remember, Jesus has these sayings. But as John MacArthur said years before, to understand and interpret the Beatitudes correctly, you need to understand the Beatitudes are like stair steps. And you kind of enter the first one, and you start walking up these stair steps. And the very first steps that you step on in the Beatitudes, humility, brokenness. Listen to Jesus' words. Matthew 5, verse 3. Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Verse 5, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. You see, you start in brokenness. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And then we'll look what it leads to. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, Jesus is the one. He says your sins are forgiven. And brokenness is that first step that we acknowledge. We, we taste his grace. And we acknowledge we break. We're broken. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I turn from my sins. I turn to you. I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. This parable does not deal with the amount of sin in a person's life, but the awareness. Simon had just as much sin in his life as this woman, but his pride blinded him. And don't miss those last words of Jesus. So important. Notice in verse 50 in your Bibles. And he says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In the Greek, it literally translates, go into peace. Now, this is so important because a Jewish rabbi would pronounce at a funeral, 
for the deceased to go in peace. But for the living one, he would pronounce, go into peace. And so here's Jesus. He tells this woman, your sins are forgiven. You now, the living one, as you start living and walking this abundant life, go into peace. Brokenness is the gateway to salvation. Dr. Chuck Lawless, a professor, one of our seminaries, he served as a pastor for many years. He shared about a missionary who came to speak at a church he pastored years before. He couldn't remember the missionary's name. He couldn't even remember where the missionary served. But what he remembered was that God was all over this man. He said it was like God was just all over this man because his anointing, his power, his faith, it was just all over this man. After the service was over, he says, I just noticed, i got to ask you. God's just all over you. There's just something different and, and some anointing, some power over you. Is there something that's, that's happened in your life that caused this? And the missionary said, I'll tell you what happened. I prayed for God to break me of my self-dependence. I prayed for God to break me of my self-dependence. That's not the answer Chuck Lawless wanted to hear. But he went on to pray that and discovered a very painful process As we get ready to close, how do we apply this? You and I can't walk out of here and say, okay, Lord, make me broken. But you and I can cultivate brokenness in our lives in three ways. I want to leave you with this application before we close our eyes, pray, and enter into a time of of response. How do we cultivate brokenness? Three ways. Number one, look to the cross. Just look to the cross. Just fix your eyes on Jesus as he was there suffering having his body shed and torn apart and being tortured for the forgiveness of our sins, just look to the cross. That should start cultivating a brokenness in your heart. Number two, study sin in the Scriptures. Study sin in the Scriptures. So often, many new Christians and many of us long-term Christians, we kind of like to skip over Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all those laws, all those sacrifices. But I'm going to tell you the value of reading those books. They remind us of how serious, how disgusting, how filthy, how offending our sins are. And to look back and see before Christ came how they, the Jewish people had to go through all these sacrifices and all this process because sin is serious. Study sin in the scriptures. Third and finally, pray for a contrite heart. Pray for a broken heart. God, break my heart. Break my heart on the things that break your heart. Pray for God to cultivate brokenness in your heart and my heart. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment, just a few seconds. I'm going to have a prayer. We have a time to respond to God's word this morning. But I've got a couple of questions I want you to answer to God this morning. The first. When is the last time you were genuinely broken over your sin? When was the last time you were genuinely broken over your sin and felt poor and needy before God? Has that ever happened to you? Maybe today's the day of salvation to acknowledge, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Just like that woman, just like that Pharisee. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I turn from them, I turn to you. And Jesus on that cross, he died for every sin in the past, every sin in the future. Every known sin, every unknown sin. Every big sin, every small sin. Every sin of commission, every sin of omission. But the second question is, How was your brokenness seen and revealed by an openness before others? How was your brokenness seen openly before others concerning your true state of being?
Maybe today's the day you need to come to this altar, maybe on your knees, and pray for brokenness. Maybe brokenness in your own life, in your family. Maybe brokenness for our nation. Brokenness in our churches. Brokenness in our pulpits, our pastors. I need brokenness. I need to be broken. Would you be brave enough and have the courage to pray that prayer? God, break me of my self-dependence. Father God, give us the courage to pray that prayer. Break us of our self-dependence. God, break me of my self-dependence and help me to be in it. Father, I pray that you'll help us embrace the moments when we're suffering, like Ron said, the operatory prayer. Help us to embrace those moments that when we're suffering, you're there. And you have a great purpose. Help us to seek Jesus in the middle of our suffering. Break us of our pride. Break us of our self-dependence. And may our brokenness be a sweet fragrance to you, Lord, to be used. May we be so broken that we see your feet and see where you're heading, seeing where you want to lead us. We look to you to lead us through this time of response and invitation. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Would you please stand as we have a time of response as the Lord leads you and the Holy Spirit leads you. Would you come this morning? Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures, feed us. For our use, thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Thou hast bought us, thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us, thine we are. We are thine, do thou befriend us, be the guardian of our Flock from sin, defend us. Seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn Jeff, maybe I needed to sit over here during the invitation so I could see the words myself. So. Let me have a word of prayer. I want to pray for over our luncheon this afternoon. And again, all my special widow, widowers, single adults, you can head on over there. And the minute you get your food, if the deacons are ready, um, you can go ahead and start eating. So let's pray over that and pray as we're dismissed this morning. Our Father, we thank you so much that we just have the freedom to come and gather and worship you. 
May we never take it for granted, the freedom we have in this country. And I thank you so much for each person that you've brought here this morning and those who have been watching uh, this morning online. Uh, Father, for this food that we're about to have over the special lunch and bless it to nourishment of our bodies. And I just, again, pray your blessing and favor upon all these special, precious saints who just encourage, strengthen us, and just what an example they are. Honor, let us honor them, Lord, in a mighty way as we honor you in all we do. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Hey, Ben. Hey, Alan.